Okay, so the topic I want to challenge this morning, I want to tackle here this morning, is in one sense, is in one sense a difficult topic, but in another sense, you have to receive it at face value so that it's simple and it makes sense. And it has to do with, with God and His, uh, His, let's just say His being, His state of being. And so first of all, God has a state of being that we do not have. When Jesus was talking to that woman there at the well in John 4, she was trying to figure out, after she realized who Jesus was, that He was a righteous prophet, she perceived that He was a prophet and a righteous one at that. She then flipped the conversation away from herself back to how to worship God. And she was saying, which is the proper place or proper way to worship? Is it in this mountain or that mountain? Or what is the proper way to approach and worship this God is what she was asking. Jesus explained to her in very simple terms, God is a spirit. And anyone who worships Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And the reality of it is, is we actually have to approach God with that view in every aspect of our lives, in spirit and truth. If there's any area of your being, any area of your mind and soul that does not accept God in truth, you're going to be missing a blessing, a form of victory, power, and different things in your life because you're not looking at God properly. You're not viewing the Almighty God from a truth standpoint. You've created your own imagination about God in that area, or you picked up a doctrine or teaching that is not accurate about that topic. And so, for, for us to walk in the greatest level of anointing, deepest measure of peace, the fullest measure of power and love flowing forth from us, the greater uh, potential of, I want to call it victory, over obstacles in life. The greater measure you want to achieve of that, those types of things in your life, the simpler and more pure your understanding of who God is needs to be. So first of all, God is a spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. This spirit from God can be felt and understood and has been felt and understood in all of creation, in all of the existence of the world, in every single man and woman that walked upon the face of the earth. That had any, any you know, in a, in a children, I'm not sure what level of understanding they have, but anyone who came to a normal, proper function of thought and understanding in life knew in their spirit that God exists. Every single person. There's not one without excuse. In Romans 1, it says that. Paul's writing here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Or other translations say, who hold back or hinder the truth. Hold meaning like prevent it in unrighteousness. Romans 1, starting on verse 18 right now. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who withhold, hold back, hinder the truth in unrighteousness. That's where the wrath of God is revealed. Because that which, meaning all of the things that may be, may be known of God is manifest in them. Those who hold the truth back in unrighteousness. All of what you can understand about God is already in them. Deep down inside. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even His eternal power and Godhead, simply by looking at creation. Just by looking at the awesomeness and the simplicity and the beauty of creation, every person who ever walked on the face of the earth knew and understood the eternal power of God so that they are without excuse on judgment day. Because of that, when they knew God in that simple, spiritual, gut-feeling form, they did not glorify Him as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and started creating their own form of God. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, uncorruptible God, into an image made like unto corrupt idols, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So, that verse made it very clear to me years ago already that there is not one single person who ever lived on the face of the earth who can come up on judgment and say, oh, I, 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 I didn't know you existed. How was I supposed to serve you? No. Every person has it born with, placed within their soul. And so I knew that. And I like to understand things. And through conversations, you learn. Reading, you learn. Anyhow, I had, we had tourists at our place one evening. And I always like to witness to the tourists about my faith in Christ. And it's not always the same how you start out. I don't have a format. I don't have a list of questions I go down. I just flow with the conversations. And so here one evening, after we sat down and started eating and talking, I discovered, there was four people there, I discovered that the one on my right at that upper end of the table is an atheist. Just, no, nah, I don't believe in God. I'm, I'm an atheist. The one at the head of the table is a lady, and she said, well, she said, uh, I'm not an atheist, for sure not. I mean, I, I do believe s some sort of God exists. But somehow this, this, this vast, um, invisible, powerful spirit form exists. And it conduces and conducts everything in our lives. Boom! Right there. Right there. That lady's on to something. This man over here is in flat-out denial. No, 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 I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in God. This lady's like, somewhere, it, this thing is out there, but it's somehow deep within us. I'm like, that woman is on to something. Right there is where my conversation is going to hang on. The two people on this side were like, oh, well, we're, we used to be Christians, but eh, we're, we're not sure where we're at right now. Huh, I know where you guys are at. You're backsliders. Okay, I didn't say that kind of stuff, right? This is what goes through my mind. I don't say things like that. I just do that in the spirit. But the rest of the night, our conversation, I should say the rest of the mealtime, another hour and a half or so, the conversation revolved around this spirit being that's out there. It's bigger than ourselves, and yet we know it's there, and it's within ourselves. I asked all my questions basically directed at her, and yet it included everyone around the table. It was anointed. Because the Spirit of God was there. God was working in her. This guy was living in denial. These people need to repent. And so right here in the middle is where all the power focused. Right on, the, on that lady. And I don't remember the flow of the conversation or what we all talked about. But I know it was very, very powerful. Matter of fact, it was so powerful. That when, when the guests were leaving, we always bless them and shake their hand and we have a little booklet called The Prayer of Jabez. We hand it to him and encourage him to read it. It's a, just a simple little booklet about the uh, a power of prayer. And so the lady up on the, uh, was up on the, that knew about the existence of God by spirit form because she could feel it. She was, she was just like, thank you, thank you for the conversations tonight. I, I somehow I feel like I got this greater understanding of who God is. The couple that needed to repent didn't have much to say at all. The atheist, as he shook my hand, he said, it was, it was a lovely time. God bless you. <laughs> yeah! Got it! Got it! I got him. Or God got him or something. 
As he was, and he was shaking my hand as he was saying that. And I said, stop right there. I said, an hour and a half ago, you said God doesn't exist. And now you're saying, God bless you to me. Ah, man, you got me on that one. Shoot. <laughs> and he walked off like that. I said, wait a minute. I said, you know this God exists. I said, I encourage you to pick up a Bible and start reading because you know he does exist. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. That is who God is. He is a spirit form. And he is, he is powerful. And every person knows that. And so that was, this, this, this verse helped me many times when I was out in the streets evangelizing because people were like, no, I don't believe in God. He doesn't even exist. But I knew that they knew that he does. And so you could steer the conversation from the angle of knowing that they know. In Genesis 1, we read about this spirit of God, this, this invisible yet powerful thing that exists. It moved upon the face of the waters. It was, it was alive. It was there. It was real. And, and from, from that point forth, once you start reading here, is where that spirit of God began to put life on this earth. There already was life in the celestial form. Because God and His Godhead and His people, His, His team, let's put it that way, existed from eternity past. Somewhere they were always there. Him and His deity, His team. So, with that reality, and knowing that God in that spirit form is everywhere, and also is Almighty, or meaning all-powerful, means He is not limited to space. He exists everywhere. David, in Psalms, was saying, If I go into the ends of the earth, behold, O Lord God, Thou art there. If I go unto the ocean, unto the sea, and, and go into the depth thereof, behold, even there Thou art there. He was saying there is no place that God does not exist. He is everywhere. When you look out into space, there is no method of measurement to teach us mentally how far it is out there. Because when you reach the furthest point that you can see, which is unmeasurable, if you could go to that point and look again that far, it would just be another Countless times that far again. It is the existence of God. And because He is all-powerful, then it means that He is not limited to anything. There is not one single limitation that God has in and of His self. We limit God sometimes when we won't obey Him. And so we put some limitations, same as these guys holding back the truth and unrighteousness. But God in Himself is not limited when it comes to power. That is why when He spoke things into existence, there in, in, when, God, when He created the earth as we know it, when He spoke it, it formed, it became. So there was nothing there, and then He spoke it into existence, it became as you see it. Earth, rocks, Flowers, trees, separation from the waters above and the waters beneath, stars, the celestial bodies, suns, the planets, all of that. He spoke it into existence. Oh, nobody could do, yeah, nobody could, but God can. Because He's all-powerful. He also has the power to put into our lives. Right now, we are in one sense limited in physical form. So we carry the life of God within ourselves as believers and followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ. But there is coming a point in time. For instance, when a person dies, his body, the spirit within him, is no longer held captive inside the body. 
but becomes a spirit being such as or like unto spirit being of God. The spirit being within us that is trapped within us, which will be released at death, can then move at the speed of light. Because we're spirit form. Yeah, but that's only magic or that's a dream or only some little visionary boy's imagination. No. It's real. Because it's how God designed the spirit to work. He is so powerful and so amazing that he could make, take Jesus' physical body and change it so that when, when Jesus knew where his disciples were meeting after he was crucified and raised from the dead, they didn't know, they didn't know he was raised from the dead where they hadn't fully accepted they knew the, the ladies told him. God so transformed, because God's powerful, Jesus' body that he could walk right through the wall. Step inside the room and say, Behold, do you have any fish or bread to eat? He's basically like, Hey, I'm hungry. You got anything to eat here? Where'd that guy come from? The doors are locked. Okay, God is not limited. You get my point. God is not limited in what he can do because he's powerful. When he operates in his realm. He's not limited. When He wants to work through us and we say, no God, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Then there's a limitation in God doesn't just take us at that point and say, yes, you are going to do that. I'll make you what you want. He doesn't do that. He could, but He don't because He has given us free will choice. So God is all powerful. We cannot, we, we, we cannot, yeah, we can kind of grasp that because if we make it real simple, He can just speak anything into existence that He wants to. That's how powerful he is. That'd be awesome if we could do that. Oh my goodness, I have so many things I would create. <laughs> but I'm limited because I'm not God. Let's talk about it after church. <laughs> so I'm going to read from I'm going to read from Isaiah 40. I'm just going to pick out some different references and parts here that I picked out to talk about this. Isaiah 40, verse 28 and 29. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. And this is why I tell believers when you are walking down this journey of trying to figure out God, there is no searching or there is no conclusion in our limited minds of his understanding. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint, neither can he get weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Yet he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. And so what this is saying is, is there's topics like, okay, so the Bible says God always existed. He always, always, always existed. Oh, that means he didn't sometime start? So, no, he didn't. He never had a beginning because he always existed. Okay, stop there. Because you could, you could end up in the mental ward in the hospital if you determined in your mind you're going to figure that out. You cannot. You cannot figure that out. You simply look at the Word of God and say, oh, okay. He always existed. All right. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Done. God always existed. Psalms 90, verses 1 to 4. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. 
Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in the sight of God or in thy sight are as but yesterday when it's past and as a watch in the night. Okay, and so God, because He existed from eternity past, and He's going to exist into eternity future, we're going to exist with Him into eternity future. We didn't exist in eternity past. We were created. Because of that, because of that spirit form of God, He does not measure time like we do. He measures time in, in the scope of eternity. And it's, that's why it says here, a thousand years in the sight of God or in the calculation of God are as yesterday when it's past. Just like yesterday. We look back to what happened yesterday. And God can look back a thousand years and it's like, it just, oh, it's just yesterday. Because He doesn't measure time like we do. It also says that to God, a thousand years are like one day. And one day is like a thousand years. Because He existed from eternity past and will exist in eternity future. Someday we'll understand that. When we're in our spirit form, in our new body, in our heavenly realm, spiritual realm, after this age, we will then understand this, this one day being like a thousand years and a thousand years being like one day. Because we'll understand our existence without these clocks. And without the rising and setting of the sun. Right now, that's where our time is set. That's how we measure it. Then we won't anymore. I'm going to read a couple more portions of Scripture. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32. Verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and by thy stretched out arm, and there is nothing that is too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Psalms 147, 5. Great is our Lord, and great, great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. That is the last number, infinity. You know, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, and you can start adding any letter you want in front of billions and you're still counting until you get to infinity. Infinity is, there is no number, there's no limit, there's no stopping. You can't count it. It's like God, eternal, without measure, limitless. And that's what He operates out of, His understanding is infinite. Our understanding is finite. It is limited. His is infinite. It has no limit or measure, no measure or limitations. Jeremiah 10 verse 12. He hath made the earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom. His hand and hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion or decision. It also says that He measures the waters of the ocean in the hollow of His hand. Come on. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about measuring the gallons of water in the ocean with your hand, boys. You, yeah, you'd be dipping your hand and pouring it into a gallon jug for eternity, right? 
if you had to, if you had to do it. Not God. He, he just measures the amount of water in the oceans with the hollow of his hand. And I'm sure he does it just simply by his knowledge. He doesn't reach down there and... And we're like, whoa, the ocean's dry. And then he goes like, yeah, it was. No, he doesn't... God doesn't do things like that. But he measures the waters of the ocean in the hollow of his hand. And he measures the heavens, which I told you how far that is. Well, I tried to. Go out there and look as far as you can. And it's like billions and trillions of miles. And then you go to that point and you look out and it's still billions and billions times billions and billions. of. He measures it with the span of his hand. That's the span of your hand. That's how he measures space. That's because he's spirit form. He is all powerful. He's all knowing. And he's everywhere. The, the, the simpler we can settle that in our mind and soul by saying, okay, that's what the Word of God says. The Word says it. I believe it. That settles it. The greater measure of peace, understanding, and power we're going to walk in. Because when you do not accept some of these things about God that the Word of God says, you can wrestle and imagine and create thoughts and philosophies and ideas to make it make sense. You get yourself in a mess. You get yourself in a... You, you, you open yourself up. You make yourself susceptible to false teachings. That is why you have people out there who call themselves Christians. And I'm not saying they're... I'm not judging them. But there are people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Redeemer, but they do not believe that Mary could have conceived in her womb a baby by God just saying it's going to be. They're just like, that couldn't be. There had to be more happening than that. No, there didn't. If this Almighty God, who you say you believe in because you believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, if you believe that He created the world by speaking it into existence, then why can you not believe that He could put the seed of a person in the womb of a young mother? Of course He can. There are Christians who don't believe that God could have spoken Christians, who don't believe that God could have spoken the world into existence just by speaking it out. And so they choose, they, or they believe that Jesus died on the cross and died for our sins, but they choose to believe that the world came into existence through the teaching of evolution. See what I'm saying? See what I'm talking about? If you don't receive the Word of God from cover to cover at face value, just take it like it says, then you have to somehow... If you're, if you're inquisitive or intuitive, you want to know. I mean, people that don't care, it's no big deal. But if you want to know, you're, you're going to create something or pick up something else that was created by someone's imagination. Go back to Romans 1. They become vain in their imagination. And they profess themselves to be wise. Oh, whoa, hey, God couldn't really... They, they come up with this idea that God couldn't really have created the world by speaking into existence. And so they come up with this wise theory of evolution and they become professors, like wise men, and they go to colleges and they teach this crazy, awesome doctrine that they know. They are fools in the sight of God. Yep, that's what the Word of God says about them. Sorry, Darwin. That's just who you are. Were. He's the one that created the idea of evolution. God's description of such a man is just, he's just a fool. And he thinks himself professes, he professed himself to be a very wise man. And there are professing wise men going around creating all kinds of false doctrines about Jesus Christ, about the spiritual realm, about God, about the coming of the Messiah even, how it's going to be and who he is, professing themselves to be wise, and yet they're denying the simple Basic truth of the Word of God and deceiving many. And that is why I'm preaching this sermon here this morning. Do not wrestle with these things of God. 
accept them as the Word of God says that they are. Because if you continue to wrestle and continue to try to figure out with your mind, you are opening yourselves up to false doctrine and falling away from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of those people were going to get cast out. They fall too far. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. God, God allows you to drift away from His teachings and His ways and His Word. He allows you to drift away from it. But He is constantly, while you're drifting away, He's constantly drawing you back with the presence of His Spirit, with the knowledge of His Spirit within. And He is sending people into such people's lives like that atheist going down my walks, reaching out saying, God bless you. God was using that exact moment to draw that man who was in denial back to Himself. What He did after that moment, I don't know. I never met the man again. But there's a very good chance that if He took my counsel and went and got Himself a Bible and started searching the reality of this God that He knows does exist, that He repented of His sins, accepted Christ as His Savior, I'll meet Him in heaven someday. That is a possibility. But only if He allowed the Spirit of God to draw him. That was a powerful moment for that man. It shook him to the natural core of his mind, so much so that he he was snapped out of his reality when I said, whoa, stop, you just said, God bless you. It snapped him out of his trance, so to speak, that he was in. He was in a trance with this all this conversation, and he he was actually in the Spirit with us. That's why he was able to look me right in my face and say, God bless you. And I said, boom, dude, get a hold of yourself. Because if you don't, God's not going to either. He's going to let you go. The lady at the head of the table, if she continued continued from that point forth to pursue this feeling of God, she felt God. She said, I know somehow this God exists, but I don't know how to know him was what she was saying. If she pursued him from that point forth, she too would have come, will have come, or does, will sometime yet come, to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because there are people out there who acknowledge God, acknowledge His existence, but deny Jesus Christ and say, no, He's not the Messiah, He's not my Savior, I don't need Him, I'm, I got my own way. They will not come to God. But those who seek God, in spirit and truth, will find Jesus. I don't care if you're in some unreached, tangled up, hot, mosquito-infested jungle. If these Romans 1 verses become life to them and say, okay, I'm in this miserable jungle, I'm in the middle of this, not miserable, I'm in the middle of this jungle, and somehow I know that there is a real God, and I choose to serve Him. That person that decides that in the middle of some unreached jungle will find Jesus. He will. Because the Spirit of God has continued to draw him. As the Spirit of God continues to draw him, he will continue to follow, and God will lead that person to someone, or He'll send someone to that person who will teach him about Jesus. doesn't matter where they are. Any man who will seek God diligently will be found of Him. God does not cast anyone out who seeks Him, seeks after Him. And because the only way to God is what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus also said, no man can come to the Father except he be drawn of the Father. And so no one can come, even come to God, no one even can come to the understanding of Jesus Christ unless they're drawn by the Spirit of God. But Romans 1 establishes that every person has that knowledge and is already being drawn. All you need to do is follow. Follow the Spirit of God. It will lead you to Jesus Christ, which is the way to God. Complex? No. Simple? Yes. So what is God like? Well, God wanted to show Himself in Exodus 19. God wanted to show Himself to the children of Israel. Children of Israel were an untaught group of slaves. 
who had some form of religion, but they had, they had lost a lot of what they were originally walking in under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's anointing of faith. Being sold into slavery, being disconnected from their roots, and from that culture brought them to a place where they did not know God. They didn't know Him. And, they, they, and yet there was, there was enough of knowledge of God within them that when Moses came preaching the Word of God at that time, and God working miracles through the hand of Moses in the land of Egypt, they had a knowledge and understanding of God. And then they had their instructions Put the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, on the doorposts so that you'll be saved. And they had visible deliverances, powerful deliverances by the hand of God. They had a pillar of fire by night. Pillar, it gave them light. A cloud in the daytime, it gave them shadow, shade from the intense heat of the desert. And they were told by Moses and Aaron, that's God. God is the one leading us. God is the one protecting us. God is the one that gives the man. So they were beginning to get an understanding of God. At one point, there in Exodus 19, God said to Moses, gather your people together. Call a three-day fast. Sanctify yourselves. Wash your clothes. Prepare yourselves to meet me. I'm going to come down on that mountain, Mount Sinai. I'm going to come down on that mountain. I'm going to speak to you. Remember the question, what is God like? These people didn't know God yet. Three days later, when they had done the washings and the fasting and the purification and preparing themselves to meet God, God came down on that mountain and it was a powerful experience. That mountain shook. Let me just read it. Exodus 19. So first of all, God gave them a commandment. He said, be ready, the against, be ready the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon, upon Mount Sinai. And thou, Moses and Aaron, you're supposed to set bounds unto the people round about, saying, take heed to yourselves, be, be careful, that ye do not go up into the mount, nor touch the border of it, for whosoever touches that mount shall be surely put to death, while God is on it. And Moses went down, from the mount unto the people, Moses was up there talking to God in the first place, and he went down, he sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, and he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. And it came, on the, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that they were, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And the Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, and the Lord descended upon it in fire, and smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded loud and longer and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. That is one of God's demonstrations of His power. So He wanted to show these people that this is who you're dealing with. This is who's leading you. This is who I am. They didn't know God. It was a tremendously fearful experience. This mountain was huge. This mountain was shaking. This mountain was on fire. This, there was smoke billowing up off of that thing. And this trumpet and this voice got louder and louder and louder. I wish I could have been there. I'm sure it was awesome. Fearfully awesome, but I'm sure it was awesome. Because they got to see God in that form. Some years later, when Elijah was running from, this, from God, no, 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 sorry. Elijah was running from Jezebel because she threatened to kill him. So he ran far, 40 days. He ran 40 days, I think he ran 40 days journey. He ran in the strength of some food that an angel gave to him on the first night. He said, you're going to need this for your journey. 
Here, Elijah. You don't need this for your journey. Eat it. And he ran in the strength of that food for 40 days. That's, that's, that's pretty awesome. That's God providing strength for his children. Even in that case when he was running for his life in fear, God could have said, hold it, Elijah. Don't run from Jezebel. But he left him make a choice. And he said, here, angel, take this food down. He's, I know he's going to run for 40 days. So give him this food so he has strength to run for 40 days. Sometimes we run journeys like that. We make a decision and we stay going and start going in that direction and it's not the right direction. But God sends Holy Spirit or angels as ministering spirits and He says, here, strengthen my son. Strengthen my child. I'll meet them there when they get there. So 40 days later, Elijah is in this cave and he still cannot find God. He was running for 40 days trying to find God. And so he stood at the door of his cave and there was a powerful, powerful earthquake. And this powerful earthquake threw tremendous boulders down the mountains crashing. Can you imagine that? I mean, I've been up on top of a mountain picking up boulders as big as my arms could handle or two or three of us getting on the same boulder and casting it down a very, very steep place just for the joy of watching that thing go and smashing trees to bits as it went just for the fun of doing that. And here, God is sending massive boulders down off these mountains. And Moses, or Elijah was there looking for God in that earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a massive firestorm, a thunderstorm of some sort, lightnings and fires and thunders and powerful display of God in a sense. But God wasn't in that. I think there was three mighty, mighty, mighty uh, movements of nature and the word after each one, it says, and God was not in the storm or the earthquake or the fire. And then God whispered to Elijah in a very still, small voice. Okay, I'm comparing. What is God like? He showed himself to the children of Israel on the Mount Sinai in a powerful, powerful way with the voice that got louder and louder and louder and the people feared and trembled exceedingly. Here, Elijah after seeing these storms of fire and earthquake and wind. Oh yeah, there was a wind that picked up massive boulders and just threw them around. God wasn't in that either. God spoke to Elijah and said, What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? And I don't remember how Elijah answered it. But God said, Go back. And face Jezebel. Just go back. Go back and face Jezebel. Just go back there. Yeah, go back there. Yeah, go back there. Now, I don't know if the angel gave him food again and he went a 40 days journey. Yes, Timothy, you have an answer? Oh, you have a suggestion. Yeah, okay. I thought you were saying you had the answer to whether God gave him the strength to go, <laughs> gave him special food again or not. And so, God is a spirit. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is everywhere. He is all-powerful. And He knows everything. Everything? Yeah. Oh, okay, I guess that means everything then. Yeah. God knows everything. You mean He knows what I'm going to be thinking 50 years from now? Yeah. That's part of everything. You mean He knew every decision I was going to make before He created 
the world. Yeah, 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 he does. That's everything. It's part of everything. Oh, that means then I don't have any choices in life and I'm just, everything's already set. God, no. It's just that God knows what choices you're going to make. He knew what choices you were going to make before he created you. He knew that. He knew some of the choices you were going to make weren't going to be the right ones. He also knew when you were going to repent. He also knew everything. There again, if you try to wrap your mind around, whoa, whoa, stop, stop, stop. What's the current population of the, of the world? Somebody knows somewhere like 21 billion? Billion? Seven billion. Seven or eight billion currently, right now. And so, because God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere, He knows everything. Did you hear me? Everything. Past, present, and future about all those people at the same time. Imagine that for a computer, you computer whizzes. That's just like... We can accept that and just say, you know what? The Bible says God is everywhere. He is all-powerful, and He knows everything. We can accept it right there at face value and say, yes, Lord, Your Word says it. I believe it. That settles it. Or we can wrestle with and wrestle with and wrestle with and try to imagine, try to create, try to read, try to study, and pick up other ideas that suggest different. And that's why I feel this was on my heart this morning to preach this sermon because God does not want us to figure all those things out. He wants us to take His Word, read it, and say, you know what? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. When you do that, God will then start giving you revelation on things that you did not understand before. He will give you revelation on what He wants you to understand. He's not going to tell you everything. I've had those personal experiences where I'd be reading a portion of Scripture and it doesn't make any logical sense. Or I had lies in my head that didn't agree with what the Word of God was saying. And so I was choosing to believe a lie and saying, uh, I went as far as one time saying, that's a lie, that's not true. Push the Bible back. Push it back on my desk. That's not true. That's, that's a lie. Can that be possible? Can God lie? No, it can't. God can't lie. And as soon as I did that, the Holy Spirit whispered in a very, very tangible way. I felt it. The Holy Spirit whispered and said, that is the Word of God. I started shaking. I reached out there and got the Bible again. I pulled it forward. And I read it again. And it still said the same thing didn't change. said the same thing it did 30 seconds before. But what changed was, I said, all right, I'm making a choice right now to believe this word exactly how it's written, even though I don't understand it. That's what I'm talking about. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. In the next two weeks following that incident at my desk, I got very clear understanding on that specific portion of Scripture. God will do that over and over and over again for every one of us if we just simply accept the Word of God at face value and say, okay, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Everybody repeat it with me. God said it. I believe it, that settles it in Jesus' name.